What up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of The Daily Dose. It's your boy, Adam. We are chilling in the cut, just hanging out today. We're going to be diving in and taking a look at the latter portion of the book of Philippians, aka the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. Okay, We're looking at chapters 3 and 4. That's going to be closing us out of this book today. We'll be moving on tomorrow. We also have Psalm number 12 on the plate today as a side item. Okay, Let's jump in and see what we're, what, what we're working with. Right? Let's see what we got going on. Let's see what had happened. What had happened was, so Paul opens up here um, with a section where he talks about no confidence in the flesh, right? How he has no confidence in the flesh. And he says quite a few things, but one of the things that, um, that I took note of is verse 7 through 9. Here's what he says. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. So it, it seems that he's talking about, look, whatever things before Christ... Whatever I thought I gained, whatever th- material things possibly, um, whatever knowledge, whatever I gained before, he's like, now I consider that all loss for the sake of Christ, right? Then he says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing wor- surpassing, excuse me, surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So much was just said right there. But what stands out to me is Paul is saying, look, no matter what I've got, I consider it all garbage, right? I'm willing to throw everything away that I have just so that I can get to know Christ better. Friends, I wish I could say that. Can you say that? Right? Like, I, I, I wish that I could honestly say, look, I, I'll throw everything away. I care about nothing but Christ. I think I'd be lying if I said that, right? I like to say that. I would like to. I long to be able to say that. But I don't know that I'm there yet, right? Where I can say, take everything away. All I need is Christ. I know spiritually, and I know from a logical standpoint that that's true, right? That Jesus is all I need. But when it comes to actually living that out, it's scary and it's hard to do sometimes, right? And then Paul goes on at the very end, again, of what we just what we just read. He, he goes on to say um, that he has righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ, right? The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So the righteousness that we get, that we inherit from Christ, that comes by faith in Christ through God. Not by works, but through faith. The catch is that there is real faith and fake faith. There is real faith and dead faith, right? So the implication here is that the righteousness that comes from God is on the basis of genuine faith, right? Because there is a distinction, James tells us. There is a very big distinction, and Paul talks about it too. Jesus talks about it, right? It's all over the New Testament. There is a big distinction, okay? an eternal distinction between true faith and dead faith, a.k.a. fake faith, a.k.a. counterfeit faith. There is a huge difference between the two. They are not the same, right? So whenever the Bible talks about faith, um, I almost like to preface it by adding the word in there, genuine faith, because that's the implication when they're talking about faith, right? They're normally talking about a genuine faith, Okay, because if it's not a genuine, real, living faith, then quid pro quo, it's actually not faith at all. So the next section Paul talks about is um, he, he's encouraging the Philippians to follow his example, right? And he's talking about how other people <clears throat> um, live according to the flesh. In verse 19, he says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Do you believe that? That's exciting news. If you believe that, right? right? That Jesus is ultimately one day going to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Friends, if you trust in Christ, right? If you trust in Christ, put all of your faith in Christ, 
and you really believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and you really accept that, and you really believe, friends, if you do, <clears throat> one day Jesus is going to transform your lowly body, right, into a glorious body like his. And that is exciting, friends. Let's set our minds on that. Let's set our minds on the goodness and, and the power of God and the creativity of God. And think about what those bodies are going to look like. I can't even imagine it's going to be so awesome. Amen? So then Paul moves into um, <clears throat> to a, a final section here in chapter 4. This is just kind of a closing chapter. Um, he, he talks about, uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, Eudia and Syntyche or Syntyche, right? He says that I plead um, with them to be of the same mind. It appears that, that these women may have, um, may have some differing opinions on something. I'm not really sure. But Paul is pleading for these two women to be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he goes on to kind of give some final exhortations before he thanks the Philippians for the gifts that they have given him along the way. In the final exhortation section, I just want to point out real quick, verses 4 through 7, <clears throat> he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Okay, I'm going to pause right there before I get into chapter 6. So verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. I think that's a command. I think he's telling us, hey, you guys need to be rejoicing, right? And, and when? When should we rejoice, Paul? When? Paul says, always, right? In the good times, in the bad times, in the happy times, in the sad times, in the times when you're laughing, in the times when you're mourning, in the times when you're crying, in the times when you're um, welcoming a new life into the world, in the times when you are saying goodbye to the loss of a loved one. <clears throat> At all times, we are to rejoice, okay? Then he says, let our gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near, right? We need to not only be gentle, but be so gentle that everyone notices how gentle we are, not for the purposes of saying, ooh, look how gentle I am, right? No, but we need to be gentle in such a way that it's obvious to everyone that we are gentle people, that we are people of the Lord. And then here comes the next thing that I believe is a commandment. Verse 6, he says, do not be anxious about anything, okay? Do not be anxious about anything. I believe that anxiety is sinful because it shows a lack of trust in God, right? If we are worrying about something, and, and now look, I'm not saying that we should never worry, and I'm not saying that caution is a bad thing or a sin, right? What I'm talking about here, and I believe is similar to what Paul's talking about, is, you know, think about the word anxiousness, anxiety, right? It makes me think of worrying. It makes me think of being in a state of excessive worry, excessive fear, excessive paranoia, if you will, almost, right? And so it appears that Paul's saying, look, don't be anxious about anything, right? Whatever the situation is that you're in, pray, right? And petition God, give God thanksgiving, and he says, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ, okay? So he's saying, look, if you pray about stuff and you, you, you give it to God, you say, God, I don't know what to do. I trust you. God, please work this out. Give me the wisdom to understand what I need to do in this situation, right? I think that what Paul is alluding to is if we, if we have that kind of a mindset, that kind of a heart set, right? If we do that, he's saying the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds, <clears throat> right? But he, he has a qualifier for that. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. This peace of God that he's talking about it's almost ununderstandable. Like it transcends understanding. It's above and beyond what we can even comprehend. It's this surreal, supernatural sense of peace, right? And that's that's like that's crazy. That's mind blowing. That there can be such a thing as this shalom, this all encompassing peace, right? That is so <clears throat> so powerful and so strong. Um, and so seemingly illogical to imperfect human minds that it transcends all understanding, right? You can't wrap your mind around it. It's so vast. But anyways, from there, we just move on to this last little section where Paul, um, like I mentioned before, Paul closes out with thanking the Philippians for their gifts. And, um, and then he's got, you know, a couple of final greetings. Oftentimes at the end of his letters, he will say, hey, y'all have read this. Um, by the way, P.S., you know, go give my greetings to, you know, so-and-so, these friends of mine, make sure they know I'm thinking about them, that kind of thing. So that's all we got for today. And that's going to close out the book of Philippians, friends. So, hey, 
Thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you. And until we meet again tomorrow, we'll be in a new book. See you then. Deuces.